Hello everyone. Um, apart from that very kind introduction, um, my name's Harry. Um, like many of you, and I know Jack especially, um, I didn't really have a job after university in journalism, so I made one up. Um, um, which is, I think, a very good thing to do, and I highly, highly recommend it. I've, um, I've just joined The Sun, uh, as was said, but um, before that, for six very strange years, um, I was a blogger at Guido Fawkes, um, covering most of the last parliament, and um, actually seeing politicians nicked and locked up, um, lots of uh, some very amusing drunken times, and uh, hopefully a few policy changes, uh, government policy changes that we, we forced, which I'll talk to you a little bit at length in, in a moment. But um, yeah, um, my first piece of advice in terms of never, ever write about the media. Um, I found this out the hard way as um, I spent the last six years writing about my new editor, who I found out was yesterday, Tony Gallagher. Um, so that's a, a piece of advice I would just give you, never, ever write about other journalists, because you never know who you end up working with, and it's not that funny when it is. Um, other important uh, s lessons. The greatest stories ever told are the ones that never end up in print. Um, that's especially true at somewhere like Guido. The amount of things that came across our desk, we never, ever were able to publish. Um, Charles Kennedy certainly took the, uh, the time that he shat himself before PMQs to the, to the grave. Um, <laughs> um, so just bear that in mind, and if, if the story does look like that, too good to be true and too good to prove it, it will probably never appear in print. But you can waste all the time you like, like I did, um, five years, um, trying to stand it up. Also, same applies to sex scandals. Two people were in the room now since the Leveson inquiry, both deny it happened. Um, it didn't happen, as far as you're concerned, unless you've got pictures or, in the modern age, a, a tape. Um, and my third important lesson to you, just to begin with, is stay sober on the job. Um, Especially if you're doing diary work, um, it tends to be that you're sent to a wonderful event, the champagne is free, the vodka is flowing, you've had three canapes for supper, you wake up the next morning and go, I've got such a good, s oh, what was it? Um, you go to your wallet and in the back of a receipt you've written three words which aren't even in English. Um, and it's, it's the worst possible feeling, and it's happened a few times. And it, it, once, it ha once it happens once, you should think, oh, let's, let's never do that again. And once it happens twice, you never actually do it again. So just try and bypass that um, particular thing. It happened to me once very uh, badly when um, it was one of my first lunches I ever actually had in Westminster, which was uh, with um, Nigel Farage back in sort of 2008, eight nine when he was still a bit of a fringe, guy, fringe sort of guy. And um, well, he still is, but more of a fringe uh, weirdo than he is now. Um, and he still had his reputation for being a wonderful drinker. So this was my first big lunch. I thought, okay, have my notepad, dictaphone, never even got turned on. Um, met him at 12.30, which is a this true sign of a, a professional luncher. None of this one o'clock bollocks. A um, couple of glasses of champagne, like one does, very, going very well. Bottle of white with the starters. Bottle of white where we chose the main course. Bottle of red uh, with the beef. At this point, I am absolutely slaughtered. Um, by the second bottle, I can barely see. Uh, the notepad's on the floor, I don't know what's going on. We're having a whale of a time. He's telling me everything, all these old stories from the city, lots of good background stuff, loads of stories coming out. Um, I go to the loo to, to vomit. Um, <laughs> port, um, brandies. And by this point, it's about half past two in the afternoon. And, um, we stand outside, stagger outside, I should say, and um, Nigel lights his Rothmans, puts on his two-tone coat, and uh, says, so what are you going to do with the rest of your afternoon? Oh, I'm going to go to sleep, as I was trying to say. He's like, excellent, I'm off to do a pre-record for Newsnight. And just walks off in a dead straight line. I was just like, how do you do that? I don't remember a single story he told me that day, but... Um, it was, uh, I got one story out of it, at least it was an anecdote. Anyway, um, I don't really know what... Um, I'm still learning on the job very much myself, so I thought we'd throw it open to questions quite quickly. But um, I wanted to run you through three, um, three types of story I tend to find. They're the ones, the stories you just find. You dig around, you do your FOIs, you scattergun local government for every single possible um, piece of uh, erroneous spending they could possibly do. Very tedious, very boring, but can be extremely lucrative and productive. If you um, have six hours, it's well worth reading um, Heather Brooks' book about how she exposed the MP's expenses scandal, essentially through tenacious use of FOI and just being a pain in the ass and not, um, not giving up. YouTube 
is the most phenomenal um, resource. Um, I found my first story for The Sun, which I did last week, was about Jeremy Corbyn uh, saying the death of Bin Laden was a tra tragedy. Now, that video has been sitting on YouTube for five years, and no one cared because it's Jeremy Corbyn, and no one knew who the hell he was until um, six weeks ago. But it was d hidden deep, right in the back on page 56 of YouTube. But in the right circumstances, um, you know, a story like that can make, a, can make a real impact. It's really tedious. I've watched hours of this bastard just moan on about the same old crap. But suddenly, bang, there it was. There was the killer quote. And, you know, and then you know, it, it gets blows up. It's a proper, proper story uh, in the right climate. But you have to put in the boring slave hard labor. Um, but the fruits of it can be really rewarding. The same goes with, uh, with, with archive journalism. You know. So you want to know everything about a politician or a key figure or a public uh, for a celebrity. So you read the biography of them. Great. Very useful thing to do. You're never going to get a scoop out of a biography because anything good in a biography, anything useful at the time that they considered to be a story would have been probably flogged off uh, to the mail on Sunday in serialization rights. But that's not to stop you then phoning up the journalist who, or the author who wrote the book and say, can I have a look at your notes? Can I have a look? They will keep them. And people also love to chat about things they've written books about. And they'll be more than open to share, I've found in the past, their, their tapes, um, their, their, their notes, where they got their resources, the correspondence they had with the, with the, with the, with the person in question. And again, it's, it's not sexy. It's not Neville Thurbeck living in a, in a villa with Rebecca Lewis for six months. God knows what he did there, but um, <laughs> it's hard work. And you know, you say you want to be a journalist, yeah, a lot of it is really bloody tedious. But when you hit the sweet spot, it makes it all worth it. Because you, th you never think, oh, that story was rubbish. I had to spend nine hours reading through uh, you know, telegrams. But you know, if you do find something decent, it makes it all the worthwhile. Now, the second type of story are simply the ones you're told. Um, you know, okay, obviously a phone-in is a, is a decent story. A piece of information you know, is passed to you for some reason that someone wants to get it out there. Very easy. But there are lots of variations within that. You know, people in my field, so, so politics, you know, people who are at cabinet level have never, have basically made a career of, of, of shutting up and never really talking and keeping their head down and sticking to the party line and making it to the top. They're not the ones you want to talk to. You could have the best contact book in all the world. You know, Andrew Rawnsley from the Observer can phone up any member of the cabinet he wants and natter on and bore them on the phone. He doesn't break any stories. Um, the people, you know, people at the top of politics are very boring. You want to go to slightly below the next level, and this can be applied across any, any sector, really. The researcher, the disgruntled advisor, the pissed off person, the little guy. Find the little guy near the big guy who is much more likely to talk. At the end of the day, when their boss has been a complete prick, they're far more likely to, over a bottle of wine, tell you a little nugget of information, which they know what they're doing. They're just putting the boot in a little bit, but it's enough. And you can start to pull on that string, which in a way you could have spent you know, 200 quid taking out their boss for lunch and got nothing out of it. So look for the ones that don't necessarily send the emails, but the ones that see the emails. Um, so that's your second category. Don't be you know, that boring client journalist who just takes down copy of what they say, but find the person with that something actually interesting to say. There is a market there. And then the best ones have always come from the ones you make up. Not in the classic sense of making stuff up, but the ones you make into a story. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm talking tabloid stings and texting Tory ministers pictures of, uh, of, of all sorts, but the ones that, you know, again, it's a bit boring, you put the work into. If you are interested in discovering something about a, a certain politician or finding, um, finding a story on someone, be the expert on that person, read everything, become a history book of that person. It's much easier to call a politician out for lying and having a good story like that, when you know their, their backstory, when you know their past. And again, these are the sort of stories that can take months and months and years and years. But you've got to immerse yourselves into your set genre. I chose it, I didn't choose it on purpose, but I've ended up as, having it as politics. But there are people who pop up now and you think, ooh, five years ago, that's not what you were saying. And if you just don't have that sort of background knowledge of your specialist subject, you can't do it for everything. You can't be a brilliant sports writer and a brilliant political hack. You can't do showbiz with the sort of level of depth that it actually deserves without, without first sort of focusing on it and learning the history of it. 
And so, um, again, it's not sexy, it's not boring, but it can be so lucrative. And then the third sort of subsection of that uh, particular category, of the ones you sort of make up, is the, is the persistence angle. Chris Yoon, we were told day after day after day at Guido, you're never going to get him. It's a dead story. Leave it alone. You look like psychos. Why are you following him with a camera? Um, and we just would not give up because we knew that bastard was lying. It was so obvious that he was lying. You could see it all over his smug face. But we did. We stayed on that story for 18 months. And every time the police looked like they were about to drop the case or there was a, you know, people were losing interest in it, we just kept running stories on it. And if you can do that, if you have a, find a platform, and online is a brilliant platform for that, is just drip, drip, drip. Just keep that story going. Just keep, it in the, keep that flame alive. Keep it in the public, back of the public's mind. It's still there. That can be a, um, a brilliant way of doing it. I'll give you just a couple of other examples on that because I think that is the most important way you, you, can, you can find a scoop is you've just got to be persistent. You've got to keep it there. You've got to keep the scoop alive. Um, you know, brilliant stories don't just fall out of nowhere. They are the work of, of, of years at times. Um, one very funny one we did, um, I was left in charge of Guido quite early on actually for a summer. Um, and um, I didn't really have anything to write. So... Um, we decided to do a series of silly season stories, not your normal silly season stories. We decided to take down the, the government of the Isles of Scilly, um, which was about as bent as a local authority can get. It's an island of 2,000 people. The chief executive was on 150 grand and just basically nicking public money. And again, we did a very similar thing. We ran a story about it every day in August. On the 1st of September, he resigned. Um, <laughs> but it's persistence. No one had ever even shone the remotest bit of light on this. But again, it showed up a huge amount of, of problems in local government, in, uh, in uh, local finance, in corporate oversight that are widespread across the country. But because it was on such a tiny little island, this little microcosm of the rest of the country, you could actually do a long campaign over the course of a month and get very quick results. Um, the other one is a little less sexy, but um, again, it shows that persistence and keeping these things alive, and then finally, a very important thing, personalization, um, can, keep, can get results. I was out with a, drinking with a, with a source um, a few, about five years ago now, and he said, would you believe that we are paying for all of these trade union officials to be nurses and teachers and doctors and firemen and civil servants. And they're paid not to uh, actually do their job. In fact, they're paid full time to, to do trade union activity. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. He had a few pints. It sounded ridiculous. And then eventually, about six months later, um, this woman started laying into the government about, um, about the health reforms. And anyway, she was very vocal and articulate. She was absolutely brilliant on the Six Cot News. And I was like, this nurse who has sort of, you know, in tears in the hospital car park saying, Andrew Lansley is going to destroy the country. And I was like, she's a remarkably polished media performer for what must be a nurse. Um, and it turns out she wasn't a nurse. She was one of these trade union officials and a little bit of digging. And then so we said, well, how many of them are in that hospital? It turns out there were three. That was one hospital in Tooting. I said, well, how many are in that hospital? It turns out there are four. This is, again, doing the FOI campaign, sewing all together. And it turns out there are 3,500 of them across the country. And we put the pressure on, kept literally naming and shaming these people. The mail started to get involved. The sun started to get involved. When the Telegraph got involved, you knew we were getting somewhere. Um, literally naming and shaming and identifying these basically civil servants and public servants even who were not working for the public. It's not sexy, it's not tedious, but three years later, the government banned them, and um, all of these uh, trade union officials who were creaming off our taxpayers' money are, are now back to doing the job we were meant to pay them for. So you can get results, but um, you've got to put the legwork in. So um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? No? Jack. Um, this is also not that sexy. Uh, you got into journalism while at uni, right? Yeah. In a slightly unconventional way, but it'd be interesting to hear how um, people could do similar. Student politics is a rich theme of bellendry that um, <laughs> you can write about for years if you wanted to. Um, I was a bit bored. I was at Edinburgh University. Um, I was going to be a lawyer after university, but um, I thankfully never made it that far. Um, so. I started to write about, um, just out of pure frustration, the student union. And they were just absolute losers. 
amusingly enough, one of the uh, one of the key players in the in the student union at Edinburgh when I was there um, has just been elected leader of the Scottish Labour Party. Um, so uh, she's gone from the dizzy heights of the student unionism to uh, to that. Um, but so I started. I set up a website called, um, rather weirdly, Tory Bear, which was um, moving on from talking about the in and outs of student politics to talking about the worst possible sub-specimen of human being, which is the Tory boy. Um, so it was about the inner workings of these uh, of the Conservative Party youth movement, who thought they were in the cabinet, and they would go around, you know, with their handkerchiefs and their attache cases and their polished shoes and their tweeds and they would have these long in-depth policy discussions and you think, who are these people? And it was an absolute seam of, of stories. So I started to write about that and write about that and then move that on a little bit to the NUS, another entire um, subsection of awfulness. Um, and obviously, I'm preaching to the choir here, there are so many stories there, but it is, on a, it's on a little scale. It's also it's like training college for grown-up politics. And Paul Staines, who runs the Guido Fawkes um, website, had spotted the, this website I'm doing, which basically completely ripped off his MO, but just wrote about kids instead of, uh, instead of, uh, of, of grown-ups, as he put it so charmingly and elegantly in his um, uh, email to me. And he said, well, why don't you just come and see the exact same people doing the exact same thing, but just 10 years later with the stakes being a little higher? And so I did, um, and so I said, fine, I'll come in for six weeks over one summer. Um, and then um, I did that, very jolly, um, stayed in touch for a year, went back to university, and then um, Paul called me up on about April um, 2009, just as I was just doing, finishing my last finals, and um, he said, the Telegraph had just bought the expenses files, it's gonna get a bit messy down here. Um, are you interested in coming in for the summer again? And I stayed for six years. So. You can literally pluck a job in journalism out of uh, nowhere if you, uh, if you find, the right, find the right target and find the right platform. And if you can't find the right platform, set up a blog, set up your own one, and keep it funny, keep it short, keep it sweet. Don't write long, thousand-word comment pieces because no one cares. But the tab model is the exact model. Funny, short, punchy, true. And, um, you know, you'll be away. Is that all right? Good. Any more questions? Hey. There is a bit of an Americanization uh, uh, creeping into um, creeping into journalism in this country, for sure. The sort of American banking practices are now essentially Fleet Street practices, um, apart from Chinos. They will never they will never come over. Um, but um, yeah, it has changed. The the, the each intake of, of MPs are more and more serious, more and more career orientated, more and more sort of lame. Um, as it comes across. So they, they'd much rather sit around writing policy documents and pamphlets than going out and getting smashed with journalists. There is still, however, a core of it in Westminster. There is uh, something about the politician-journalist relationship that wine does help, and they both know that. They don't like us. We don't like them. But it's in both of our... Both, both, we both like wine. Um, it's been both of our interests to talk, and frankly, it's much easier to do that over lunch. But it is, you know, you are correct. It is um, an ever-decreasing uh, um, field. Hi. Um, I'm from Edinburgh, and Great. just sh should quickly mention that the Student Association and the Tory boys are just the same as ever. Good. Um, and haven't changed a bit. Uh, when... Uh, you're working on stories or trying to get a scoop or an exclusive or something like that. What do you find the best means to corroborate a story with, with other people and, and try and work around, oh, we need to make sure that we're right on this story or, or we've got the right information without losing that scoop or without kind of putting, putting the wind up people and letting them know that you're on to them or whatever? Um. Learning on the job is, is by far the best way of doing this. And, and uh, pick, pick someone you like on a paper. If you are, so I did this when I was a student, and say, look, I've got, I've got this tip. Give them enough information to get them interested on it without giving them the story, and cut a, a proper deal with them that you will you know, will work on this together. And you will learn so much more off of that person than you ever would if you'd phoned up a ma the mail news desk and said, here's a story, can I have 200 quid? 
So you want to work with on that person. And if they want that story enough, and you've got that story enough, and if they're a good enough guy they will, or girl, they will definitely help you on that. And that's a really good way of doing it. And in the end, you kind of both get the glory, but at the same time, you've also picked up a hell of a lot of key ways of, you know, so a story I worked on once was trying to prove that someone was, someone was related to someone else through, as a cousin. I had no clue about how to go around that 10 years ago, but I phoned up a guy at the mail. I didn't phone the mail news desk. I said to the journalist directly, who I'd seen had done lots of these stories before, similar sort of uh, profile pieces where you sort of prove links between people. And he was remarkably helpful, and he showed you all the tricks in the book. And, you know, that was, that you know, could have saved thousands of pounds in journalism school. <laughs> in fact, I did. Who's next? Hi. Um, would you say there are certain characteristics or a certain knowledge base that you need to have um, reporting on politics? Like, is, it, there's, is there any kind of room for certain types of people or with, with certain knowledge, or do you kind of think it's something you can learn? I don't think it's necessarily about learning. It's about sort of living it. It's not the sort of um, field you can sort of just dip in and dip out of and know. Um, breaking political news is, is very different to being a comment maker, a member of the commentariat. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you can, you can, you can all, anyone can write what they think. Like, fine, it doesn't necessarily mean anyone's going to read it. Um, but, you know, that's, that is a skill. If you're, if you're an interesting and uh, a good writer, you can, you can string together a comment piece very quickly. But to have to, to the news aspect of it is much harder. To know what is a story, how that story will, will impact the, the sort of political agenda, how knowing when to time that story, when to, if it's to keep it back, save it for a certain a few weeks later when actually uh, a vote will be on the House of floor or the House of Commons and the story will have a much bigger impact because the public's attention will be on it. That is a skill you can't really learn, but you've just got to immerse yourself in it. You've got to listen to the day programme and you've got to watch Newsnight um, and everything crazy in between then. It's the sort of field that you can't really dip in and dip out because, frankly, you miss, it moves so quickly now, especially with the advent of Twitter, with um, 24-hour TV channels. There used to be a very traditional way that you know a story would break on the Today program. It would be denied by the government on the one o'clock news. It would be picked apart on the six o'clock news, and then it would be moved on on Newsnight. So there's only really four or five points you can intervene on a story there throughout the course of the news stream. Now it breaks on Today program. It's denied on Twitter. They're on the Daily Politics on this time. They're on Sky News at one, and then the story's dead. They're getting sort of four news cycles in a 24-hour cycle. So to try and keep up with that um, without you know putting the proper sort of homework in, um, frankly, is a bit of a waste of time. Hi. Hi. Uh, so as a political correspondent, mm. how much of the stuff that you report, so I think there's crossovers, so for example, the Lord Saul thing, Yeah. Um, although that's sort of political, it's sort of not as well. So how do you, as a political correspondent, what's the scope of your reporting? You basically, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm learning the job again. Um, I've been there sort of 10 days, and... Um, it's about sort of, I mean, my role is, thankfully, it's sort of across seven days, so I get to um, get a bit more time to work on sort of big impact stories rather than just doing the coasting, the daily news stream. Um, but frankly, it's sort of all hands to the deck, really. You know, the, the Lord's Hill story, for example, um, I don't actually know the end and out of it, but I guess I would say it was a phone-in from the girls who um, worked out why this guy, couldn't work out why this guy was paying them in checks, and then obviously Googled the name on the check and thought, hello. Um, and so then, now imagine there was a bit of, that, so that becomes a news desk story, so how did they get the cameras, for example? How did the pictures get in there? How did they set it all up? So obviously there's a bit of work there. So we're in sort of Parliament, um, uh, which is, so we, we, we're based there 24 hours, where there's someone there pretty much all the time. Um, and that's, yeah. There's a weird sort of relationship between the news desk where they think that we're too cosy with the, <laughs> with the politicians and we think they don't know what they're talking about. So in a weird way, that sort of creative tension sort of helps, if that makes any sense. Cool. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a, kind of like an aspiring sort of... I want to get into reporting and then I want to get into political, sorry, yeah. political journalism as well. Could you just give me like an average day in the life of a Westminster correspondent? Um... Starts the Today program at some god awful hour. Um, breakfast meeting, it's quite. I mean, politicians they have they have a ridiculous diary. It's not. I mean, it's, 
the idea that they're all lazy and they're all in it for themselves is true to a certain degree, but they're, they're made to work hard for their, for their day. Um, so you can be in there at eight, getting, seeing someone on coffee, breakfast, something like that. Um, most of the time, though, you can start about 10, um, which is quite nice. Nothing really happens between the Today programme and, and lunchtime because everyone goes to their desks, MPs go to their offices and sort out their mail and things like that. So um, it's a sort of, there's a nice quiet period mid-morning. It goes a bit crazy um, about midday as this paper starts getting put together, so you've got to work out what the stories of tomorrow are going to be before the, the day's even played out. So send over the first sort of drafts. Um, around then. Then obviously lunch still is a, is a big important thing. Um, not necessarily that boozy, but it's, it's, you know, you're not, if you're just sitting at your desk at lunchtime, you're wasting your time to get out there and see someone, talk to someone. Um, then afternoon I go for a little wander around, see who's milling about. There's a lot of milling about in politics. There's a lot of people standing loosely on, uh, on corners of pillars uh, that are crumbling and falling down as the House of Commons slowly sinks into the river. Um, but while, while it's still standing, there's a lot of standing around in there chatting bollocks. Um, Talking to people, interrupting conversations. Yeah, it's, it, 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 po politicians love to gossip, so and journalists love to gossip too. And the two of them mix together and, and have, have, have a good chinwag. Afternoon um, goes to, uh, um, you know, there'll be press conferences, things to go to, events, um, head over. Um, six, five to six ish starts. You know, should probably be five by now. Um, and then six o'clock, the government will dump some massive data dump out on the on the on a website hidden somewhere away that they don't want us to see, and then the entire paper will get rewritten, and then you're there for another four hours. That's about roughly how it's gone so far. <laughs> a few more? Yeah. Hi. Do you ever struggle to write a piece because you're sort of conscious of your own political bias? And how do you deal with that? Not conscious of political bias, um, but you are conscious of. You should never be friends with politicians. That is, the, that is the, one of the pieces of advice I was given many years ago. And once you have to cross that line, and then you do suddenly realize why it's such an important piece of advice, um, you've got to be prepared to, to stab them in the face. Because um, at the end of the day, they are the reason you're there is to cover them, and they do fuck up. And if it's your friend that happens to be the one that dressed up as a Nazi on the stag weekend, that's really awkward. Um, <laughs> uh, because you have to say he's a dick, and he was. And um, uh, it's not nice, but the best piece of advice I think you have to do, um, which um, Simon Waters, the, Mal editor of the, Mal the political editor of the Mail on Sunday, gave me many years ago, said, um, stab him in the face, buy him a lunch on Tuesday. So um, once they've been through the mill once, they'll never want it. To do it, have to be through, go through the meal again. Um, so um, once you've turned over someone once, they tend to be actually become a pretty good source because they just want to keep you there. Um, as for bias, I, I, I haven't ever experienced it. Um, frankly, you know, uh, Guido Fork is unashamedly right wing, but that hasn't stopped us taking out Brooks Newmark, um, Tim Yeo, um, you know, all two serious Tories. If the story's good enough, then bias doesn't really come into it, regardless of your left and right, except maybe if you're The Guardian. Um, I was just wondering, now that you're kind of working in the national press, how much do you think the national press is interested in what goes on on campuses? Because I, I, a lot of it's very tedious, but do you keep an eye on... I don't, I don't have my business cards yet, but if anyone's got a good story about... <laughs> um, yeah, it's a lot of... Um, vi politicians visiting campus doing stuff is very is interesting. I mean, Oxford University Tory Association is telling racist jokes, stuff the Daily Mail dreams of. Um, so, yeah, there is, a, there is definitely a market for it. I know the, a, a senior reporter at uh, BuzzFeed who um, basically paid off his student loan being a stringer for um, the Nationals um, in his final year, um, doing in quite a lot of his friends. Um, so, uh, I mean, all power to his elbow. There's definitely a market for it. And, um, frankly, it's a very, very good way to get in with a paper, um, especially if you're applying for graduate schemes and things, if you can point to the stories in that paper that you have uh, had played a hand in, uh, in getting there. So it's not, it can be a bit brutal, but, you know, if it's the end of university, everyone's brutal. Even the accountants turn into bastards. <laughs> Any more? Cool. Uh, you briefly mentioned the Brooks Newmark story. Yes. Uh, do you ever feel that Sometimes stories kind of spill over into entrapment, um, and he's kind of creating it I, I, when there isn't a story. A prepared statement from Ipsa here. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
yes, if the if the reported versions of events in the Guardian had been accurate, yes, that would have been entrapment. But lo and behold, the reported version of events in the Guardian was not accurate. That story was based on a tip, um, quite literally in the end. Um, and um, <laughs> we get used to this. Actually, I quite like it up here. Um, <laughs> uh, no, we were tipped off that um, that Brooks, in particular, was using Facebook and social media to, to cruise and pick up girls, um, especially Tory g activist girls. And there comes a point is that the only way we could prove that is to, to, to see it in action. If we just run a story that he was doing it, he could deny it. Um, and the only way to do that was, um, was that, um, you know, that, yes, there is a case that, you know, politicians are entitled to a private life. They're also not entitled to sleaze on 18-year-old girls. But that's just my judgment. Any more? One more? No. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best of luck. Um, if, you're at this, if you're at this event and if you're working with the tab, you're, you're doing it right already. So best of luck. Cheers, guys.